I'm Flav Giorgini. I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Genetics at the University of Leicester. And my group is interested in neurodegenerative disease, uh, primarily Huntington's disease. Our approach is using model systems, so simple model systems like baker's yeast, which you use to bake bread and brew beer, um, and fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, to study some of the conserved basic mechanisms involved in neurodegenerative disease. Huntington's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder, uh, not unlike Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, which the public is perhaps more familiar with. Uh, the difference with Huntington's disease is that there's actually only one gene involved in actually causing the disease. So it's what's known as a monogenic disease, um, which is uh, rather different than Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease in which there's been many, many disease, uh, genes implicated in uh, causing disease. So in other words, if an individual has Huntington's disease, then any child that they would have has a 50-50 chance of inheriting the disease gene. One of the sinister aspects of Huntington's disease is, is the fact that it has, uh, in general, a late onset. So uh, the normal scenario is that around the age of 45 or 50 years of age is when you first start seeing onset of symptoms of the disease. Uh, and these traditionally are uh, motor problems uh, and personality changes and these sorts of things. Um, one of the most uh, noticeable a aspects is uh, what's known as chorea or choreic movements. So these are involuntary movements that the patients have. Um, and because of the late onset, it means that individuals could go on and have families before they ever realize they actually um, carry the Huntington's disease gene or have Huntington's disease. Interestingly, uh, yeast doesn't in fact have its own version of the Huntington gene. So though yeast are very, very similar, uh, yeast cells are very, very similar to higher eukaryotic cells like human cells in terms of most of the basic cellular pathways being conserved. They don't in fact have a Huntington gene. Now, um, the reason that we could actually still make a Huntington's disease model in, in yeast is because it appears that most of the symptoms or the phenotypes that you see in patients are likely due to what are known as gain of function mechanisms. Um, in this case, of gain of a toxic function, which basically means that um, when the protein is mutated and misfolds and forms these sticky masses of protein, either small masses or bigger masses, um, that you're actually causing a negative effect to the cell. So it isn't it isn't really loss of the normal function of the Huntington protein. So often in disease, in human disease, the disease is actually caused because you have a mutation in a gene and now that gene can't do what it normally does. In this case, you mutate the gene and it actually gains new functions in the cell, if you will, but these functions happen to be negative or toxic functions to the cell. Because of this, we can take this mutant protein, express it in yeast even though it's not normally there, and it causes the same negative things to occur in this cell. Because uh, we are able then to mimic aspects of, of Huntington's disease in the yeast, in our simple system, it then means that we can now counter some of these negative effects or attempt to counter some of these negative effects of the mutant Huntington protein in the yeast. So because we've developed these disease phenotypes, if you will, in the yeast, we can now do things to try to, say, revert these phenotypes. In other words, hopefully treat the yeast. Um, and these can be done uh, by a few different methods, but the most common would be to look for genes, other genes, which can modulate toxicity of your mutant Huntington. And the reason you'd want to do th this way is that perhaps you could identify novel drug targets uh, for treating Huntington. So in other words, if we found that we could inhibit a gene and that reverted some of these negative consequences of mutant Huntington in the yeast, then perhaps we could design a drug which have a similar effect. Uh, and, and that's the approach that we've been taking, which is actually look for genes. You can also do another approach, which is to actually directly screen the yeast uh, for compounds that, say, drugs that are known or from drug libraries, and actually screen the, these compounds in the yeast and see whether or not you can revert some of these negative consequences. Now we haven't taken that approach 
uh, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to actually translate uh, an effect that a compound has in yeast into higher systems because perhaps the proteins aren't quite as similar as you'd like them to be. So we feel like the genetics approach is a bit more robust because then we can find a yeast gene and then look at a known homolog or gene that is performing a similar function in a higher system um, and basically translate our results. So when we're speaking about translating the results, what we mean is to take what we're learning um, from the yeast, so taking candidates that we found that we feel can revert these negative consequences of, of mutant Huntington in the yeast, and now test them in systems that are, are what we would call higher systems or more similar to humans. So obviously a yeast cell is a single cell, it doesn't have a nervous system, um, but we can take our re results and we can say now test them in Drosophila, so, which are known as fruit flies, um, which are in fact maybe quite distant still from humans, but they do have a nervous system and they are in fact an animal model. So if we take our candidates and now test them in flies, we can look at lots of different phenotypes or symptoms. So what we know is that if you take mutant Huntington protein and you express it in Drosophila, you see neurodegeneration, just as you see in, in patients. In other words, you see neuron loss. You see impairment of locomotor activity, so the flies don't move around quite as much as, as, they, as uh, they would normally and you actually see reduced survival, so their lifespan is dramatically re, uh, reduced. So you can see how all of these different phenotypes that you see in these Huntington's disease model fruit flies are similar to what are seen in patients. And as we've done in the past with the yeast, uh, when we're able to model aspects of the disease in the flies, it allows us to study genes or drugs um, that reduce the negative consequences of, of mutant Huntington. So we've been taking genes that we've identified in yeast and now validating and testing them in our fruit fly models. And in addition to that, we've taken drugs that mimic the effect of these genes and are starting to test these compounds in these fruit fly models to see whether or not we can identify new drugs that could actually perhaps treat Huntington's disease. So our hope is that in the coming years, say in the next decade, that the work that we've initiated now, the genes that we've identified, uh, will continue, that some of these will continue to be validated uh, in higher systems. Um, and basically that our work now has hopefully served as a filter that we've been able to reduce a lot of uh, red herrings, shall we say, and that we're able to identify some really strong candidates that are worthy of exploration in higher systems um, and to really reduce, um, hopefully in the future, the number, number of animal experiments that need to be done. But ultimately, uh, what we'd like to see is that uh, candidates that we've identified in yeast and that we've validated in Drosophila will then be taken, uh, looked at in, in uh, closer detail by other groups, say, um, and hopefully that we can identify some drugs that mimic the effects of our candidate genes and that ultimately these drugs will then get into clinical trials for patients. And I think that's really what we're talking about here. I think our kind of work is, is really focused on maybe not so much curing in, is in the classical sense of the word curing a disease, but really trying to delay the onset of, of, of symptoms. Because if you can pull back, uh, push back the average age of onset from 45 years of age to 75 years of age, then to some degree you you've uh, won the biggest battle.